All right. Thank you guys very much. We appreciate that. If you have a Bible, turn to Joshua 9. Kids can make their way to Children's Church over here to my right. You can go through those doors right there, and those leaders will walk down with you or catch you on the way. It's Joshua 9 if you have a Bible, and uh, the, um, you're going to be encouraged today by this story. It's a, it's a great account in Joshua 9. It's not just a few chapters past uh, Jericho. And it's, uh, it is really an encouraging passage, I think, for many of us in this room. And uh, Israel was very clever. They had, a, they had a miserable failure. They had the success of Jericho. Then they had a miserable failure at, at A. And then they had a success at A, taking the city of A. And then they had another failure. But this was great. They're clever. They failed in a really unusual way this time. There, there's some trickery involved, and it was a bit disastrous. I think we could learn from their bad example. That's what we're going to do. I think it's going to reinforce some things that you already do really well. Um, so I think this story will help that. Uh, many, many years ago, in the family of uh, Billy and Ruth Graham, there was a, a troublesome little kid named Franklin who has turned out to be pretty good with Samaritan's Purse and all that he's done. But as a, as a young, early teenager, he was just distraught at the fact that he, would, that he was worthless. That's what he kept telling his mom, I'm worthless. I just I've made so many mistakes. And Ruth, in her amazing wisdom, said, no, 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 son, that's, that's not true. You are not worthless you are serving is a really good, bad example. Well, well, that's kind of what's going on today in, in Joshua 9. We're going to see a, a really good, bad example, and I think we'll be encouraged by some of its process. But let me turn this over to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we are glad to be able to open your word in a hectic week where we can look into your word and learn and grow and be encouraged. I'd ask that would be the case for us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Joshua 9. If you take a look at your Bible there, which I hope you brought one and certainly could use your phone, it says, As soon as all the kings who were beyond the Jordan in the hill country and in the low land all along the coast of the great sea toward Lebanon, and then it names the groups of people. They gathered together as one to fight against Joshua and Israel. But then here comes this strange group. But when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and A, they uh, they, on their part, acted with cunning and went and made ready provisions, took worn-out sacks for donkeys, wineskids worn out and torn, mended, worn-out patched sandals on their feet, worn-out clothes. All the provisions went dry and crumbly. They went to Joshua, the camp of, of Gilgal, and said, We have come from a distant country, so now we make, make a covenant with us. Well, that was a lie. <clears throat> They didn't come from a distant country. The men of Israel said, uh, Perhaps you live among us. Then how can we make a covenant with you? I mean, it's, it, this, is, this, is, this exchange is comical if there weren't so much at stake. He said, they said to Joshua, No, 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 we're good. We're your servants. And Joshua said, Well, who are you? And where did you come from? Oh, very distant country. Your servants, which they say three times they refer to themselves as servants. We've come because of the name of the Lord your God. Another lie. We've heard a report of him and all that he did in Egypt and all that he did the two kings of the Amorites were beyond the Jordan. Take provisions in your hand in the journey. This is into verse 11. And go to meet with them. And they said, we are your servants. Come now, make a covenant with us. Here is our bread. It's, it was still warm when we took it from the house. And as our food for the journey set before you, but now behold, it's dry and crumbly. Another lie. 
These wineskins were new when we filled them, and behold, they, they're ready to burst. Another lie. The garments and sandals of ours are worn out from the very long journey. Not true. So the men took some of the provisions. Here's the phrase. If you underline in your Bible, this is it. Did not ask counsel from the Lord. And Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live, and the leaders of the congregation swore to them. We're from a faraway country. We came because your God's amazing. Our bread was hot, now it's moldy. New wine, now it's old. Garments, they were new, and you believe we've come from so far they're all worn out. This is really clever. They, they did not see this coming. They, they, this was off the radar. Now, a fun study you can do on your own, which is very interesting from the very uh, start with Abraham, it's interesting how many times they were deceptive and employed trickery. That was kind of in their DNA. Can you think of some of them? Is that your wife, Abraham? That's my sister. It's over and over. Mix the animals and the ones that are spotted. Is this, this sounding familiar to some? Joseph. It, it was part of their DNA, so it is interesting that the tables have turned and now the trickery is on them. And how do you prepare for this? I mean, how... How do we prepare for the challenges that we inevitably face? Because they didn't see this coming. They were set up, because the promise of God was destroy everybody. There's no covenants. That, that was it. So there's the peak. This group came. They made a covenant with them. They were neighbors, and they didn't know it. But you notice those first few verses of chapter 9? As soon as the kings of beyond the Jordan and all the hill country and all the land or the coast of the great sea toward Lebanon, names it all, they gathered together as one to fight against Joshua and Israel. What happened, they heard all the good things, you know, bad things, the conquering cities, they're amazing, but they also knew there was a kink in the armor. They knew they lost it, A. They are beatable. It's the same as anything. It's the same as our college football yesterday. Once you lose, now we know you can be beaten. And that's what happened. News spread. Yeah, they're amazing, but they all got together and said, well, okay, I know they can lose. So enemies actually joined together. Cities that would normally not work together are working together because they realize that all together we can take them. Our past failures do create consequence for our future. I don't know how to prepare for the things that our kids are facing, your grandkids. I, I'm, I am now officially that old guy that says, I remember in school when the worst thing was, and it was something stupid. Well, that's not true anymore. How do you prepare people for the things that they're facing? When teachers are afraid to even have a Bible on their desk, I was in a school board, elected onto a school board in Arizona, and I remember the history teacher, Mr. Gray, devout Catholic man. He just loved the Lord. He had on his jacket the two little uh, feet, unborn, for the unborn, on his lapel. He told me this. I'm a board member. He goes, just so you know, the principal walked into my room and saw that and told me to take it off. I said, what you do, Mr. Gray? He says, I took one step closer to him and said, you take it off. <laughs> well, I, 
you get the wrong people in place, that school board of five members, four of them were from my church, me being one of them. He knew he had the support. There are school boards that agree Bible has no place there. We're actually in our minds today thinking, and I don't care if it's only a few or if it's many, doing gender-affirming surgery on children. This is like a TV show. This is science fiction. I don't know what our kids are going to face. How do you prepare our kids to face challenges that we don't even see coming? Because that's what happened in the story. God never said to them, oh, and be careful, some of these uh, nations may try to trick you. Oh, thanks for the heads up. I needed to hear that. No, you didn't need to hear that. Because there's one process that you and I ourselves and you do this, that we pass on to our kids and on to the grandkids, and that keeps going. There is one process that will handle any challenge that comes. I don't need to know what the challenges are, because you never will. We can't predict what the issues are going to be at work, at school. But there is a process that we can employ that is applicable to all things, one thing. It's, it's the difference of, I don't need to know what to think, I need to know how to think. I don't need to know what the issues are. I just need to know how to think and apply that to every situation that I'm facing. And they were taught it. They were actually told. The second point in your notes was how are decisions supposed to be made? How was that supposed to be faced? We see the mistake. I really do hope you underline it so every time that you see this passage, you will see verse 14 of chapter 9 that says, So the men took some of their provisions, but did not ask counsel from the Lord. Th there it is. It was the exact same mistake they made in a military operation with the city of A. A. They did not seek after the because it wasn't that big of a deal. Oh, we're not even going to send all our men. This is going to be so easy. You don't know what you're facing. Seek counsel from the Lord. You remember all the way back in Joshua 1, it's such the foundation of the book. Verse 7 of chapter 1, Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law of Moses, my servant, commanded you. Don't turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that's written in it. Then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will be of good way, uh, you have good success. That process. Meditate on the Word, and I got you covered. It's one thing. So if you look in a couple simple thoughts, and you guys are so good at this, this is a reminder to constantly have this dependency upon God. It's a couple that's dating, and one isn't certain whether or not they should get married, and what do we do? It's not checking a box and saying, oh, I'm going to go seek after God, so I'm going to open up the Bible and I'm going to read to find out if I should marry this person. It's not checking a box. It's living in a communion with God, in a communion of His Word, so that you make good decisions, whether it's dating or buying a car, because we're walking in fellowship with God. And they didn't seek any of this counsel from God student trying to figure out where to go to college, what to study in college. Oh, I need to go look in the Word. 
No, no, you need to live in the Word. The first place we look is the Word in our communion with Him. I had a college ministry for years, and Sarah and I, it was fun. We were brought in to build up this college ministry, and we worked alongside of this college. It was a pretty good-sized, healthy group. And I would say to them, this season, 18 to 25, spend time meditating on God's Word in communion with Him. Walk away from Him at 25, but not now. Because now is when you're going to choose a college and a career and possibly even choose who you're going to marry. And the truth is today, the time of which when people walk away from the church and walk away from God happens to be about those ages of 18 to 25. They are, they've, now they're married. Now they have their career. We still don't see them. Then they have a kid or they have a couple kids, and then they slowly make their way back. It, that's the template. No, do it when you're having to make decisions. And of course, it's facetious. It's all the time. It's every day. Walk in a communion with God in a communion of His Word. They were so tricky, and it's true of our lives, too. People try to sway us. And whether it, you don't have to do a timeshare to pull this off, but they have an agenda. And if you look at this group, they didn't present themselves with all of the facts. We're your servants. We love your God. And you're like, oh, really? That's so nice. And you're from so far away. And they go, yeah, we are. I mean, everyone has an agenda. Everyone has a purpose. How do you overcome that? By walking in communion with God. Not a formality merely of check a box, I talk to God about it. But living in a communion with Him. Who could quote Proverbs 3, 5, and 6? Anyone want to give it a stab? You, many of you know it, right? No? Trust in the Lord? Who can quote it? Beautiful. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Right? Right? In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will, he will direct your paths. I, I can't teach our kids how to handle being swindled out of money and how to buy a car correctly and how to buy a house and how to make decisions at work. And There's a thousand things to teach them. I can't keep up. And they keep changing. I had no idea the things that we're facing today. I would never have thought to teach our kids the things that they're facing today. I have no idea. But the one thing we do know we could teach them, trust the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. You believe that? You guys have experienced that, haven't you? Isn't it amazing? Even when you're not doing a great job at it, he still steps in, and he is so kind, and he's so gracious to us to help us make good decisions. But it's living in that lifestyle of communion with him. So in the morning, I don't know what you're going to face tomorrow. Tomorrow may be a fabulous day for many of you. It may not be a great day, or it might just be another Monday. That's why we start in the morning and say, I trust you, Lord, with all my heart. You've given me a decent mind. I can make good. Thank you for all of that. But I'm not going to lean on my own understanding because all of that's from you. And I'm going to acknowledge you in all my ways today, 
and you're going to direct my paths, aren't you? He goes, uh-huh. Yes, I will. Oh, thanks. Can you give me a hint what's coming today? He goes, nope. Or he'll laugh and go, your car's not going to start. <laughs> We're starting quick. Uh, it's going to be one of the, it's fine. It's fine. I'll direct your path. We'll walk together through this. So it's looking to God, but it's looking to God in a lifestyle, on a daily basis. But then isn't it amazing how often the Bible speaks of looking to others in counsel? I have three or four pastors that I call, usually only when I have a question. I mean, some of them, it's not like we're buddies, but I'll call them. One and I'm going to have him speak sometime, a Grace Brethren pastor out of Worcester, Ohio, um, Bob Fetterhoff, great guy. When I call him and I tell him about something, I said, oh, I'm in a bit of a pickle. He starts laughing right away. And I'm like, oh, okay, it's not funny. He goes, no, this is great. What's going on? And I'll tell him, and he's laughing. He goes, oh, yeah, you are in trouble. And he'll laugh for a while. I'm like, okay, now I need help. He goes, yes, you do. I want to talk to people who have nothing to gain and nothing to lose. And we got to stop tricking ourselves and going to people that we know are going to tell us what we know they're going to tell us. The Proverbs, it was, it's endless. The passages are nearly endless that speak of the way the fool is right in his eyes, but he that listens to counsel is wise. Without counsel, plans go awry. Plans are established by counsel. Where there is no guidance, people fail. It's over and over and over. Pause and ask people. Seek that. I'm surprised at how many people don't do that. I don't need it. I've, I've, been, I've got a lot of experience. Yeah, so did Israel. They were really knocking things out and didn't even see this coming. I was in a shop in Phoenix. This older guy, I don't know what his position was. He was in the Reagan administration, not a part of the cabinet, but like one or two removed. He was in the White House, but one or two removed. And I'm like, that's awesome. Like, it's Reagan. And he's like, yeah, he's, he wasn't very bright. And I'm like, oh, okay, whatever. And he goes, yeah, and this was the reason he wasn't bright. He goes, he had these guys around and these hand-picked people, and they're the ones that really made most of the decisions for him. And I said, I, I thought you said he wasn't wise. Because <laughs> you can be as dumb as a rock. Isn't that military? Isn't that true? You get the right people who are free to say how they see it, I think in ministry, I, I know we've made a lot of mistakes. We haven't made a lot of big mistakes. We don't make mistakes, and it's not because I'm that smart. I don't make decisions without talking to people, and I just lay it out. I've called Lee Wiggins over there. He's in Downington now. He had a church in Prescott, Arizona, church of 50, that when he left was 3,500. I don't know how he was so helpful to me because I was over the mountain over by Sedona in the Cottonwood. He's now in Downington, a Christ First Church in Downington. I'll sometimes call him, since I've been here, I'll call him and not even know the question to ask. I'm like, uh, Lee, I, I don't know. He, and he says, oh, tell me about this. Talk to me about this. Tell me this. Tell me that. And I just start chatting, and he starts talking. And I'm like, this is so, it brings us to a different level. Didn't we say that in the office this week, Casey? A problem is not solved at the same level that creates the problem. I'm down here. I need a voice to come in to talk here, because that's where the solution is. Our kids have to know this. 
They have to know this. Another example, Grant. I'm glad we learned this when he was young. There he is in the process of losing his vision, and we're not sure. And I'm like, I got to teach him to be ind- We have to teach him to be independent. And I had a great guy on staff, Denny Pearson. He came, we're talking. He goes, No, 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 you're not teaching independence. I said, Well, I don't want him dependent. He goes, No, and you don't want him independent. You want him interdependent. All of our kids need to know when to ask for help. As adults, I need to be interdependent. I need to know when I need help. I don't want them asking for help when they don't need help, right? Our kids? But if they can't do it, they need to reach out. They need to learn to reach out. Oh, I'm independent. I do all things on my own. Yeah, you're going to be a disaster. Nobody is that smart. Nobody could know. When you and I are in a situation and we're emotional in a situation, you'll not make the right decision. There's points in which we have to reach out to the right people and get our help and get our advice. Israel's a great bad example of that. I'm going to mention one more thought, and I hope you know this too. It's the last point. Are we ever too far gone to recover? Some, many, all of us have made bad decisions. Some listen to my voice online or you're sitting here and you're thinking, oh no, I've, I'm still suffering consequences of bad decisions I've made. But the faulty thinking is that that means somehow I'm on a plan B in life. I forfeited because of a bad decision or something that just happened to you. You had nothing even to do with it. That now somehow, because I didn't do that, or I did do that, or something happened, I am kind of destined for this plan B in my life. And there are so many Christians today that wake up and are like, I'm just doing the best I can. I've already messed things up. My life is already struggling. So I'm just going to settle for this plan C. Wish I were back on plan B and it is the best it can be. And that's not true. Constantly reminded of Jeremiah, he says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. If you've driven your life like a car, into the wrong side of town at night and you're like what have I done I'm on I'm in a bad area I mean it's they're so bad they're they're stealing your tires while you're moving that's how bad this side of town that you have found yourself that's I mean they're good this is not where you should be and you're like what have I done Uh, this is this was not the plan The day in which we then scoot over and humbly say to our Lord, my life is yours. It's all yours. And even more specifically, Jesus Christ died while I was a sinner. He died for me. Already gone off the path. The moment in which we slide over, we pull over in that bad area of town and we're so distraught and we're like, what have I done? Where have I put myself? I would never have chosen any of this and this is where I am today where we slide over and go, but Lord, as long as you're driving, you take it. When do you become back on that great plan for God? The moment he grabs the wheel and he goes, we're good. Now we're in this area of sovereignty of God that is so difficult to understand. In His sovereignty, I am exactly where He wants me to be. 
This is it. He's driving. I don't care if we're sleeping every night under a bridge in a prison cell, studio apartment, or a massive house. The goal is that we are walking with God and that he has complete control of our life. That's what matters. And we wake up and say, God has me here this way right now. And you can talk theologically all day long. Yeah, but you're the one that really... Yeah, okay, keep going. So those that are all perfect, it's their benefit. It's because they did it right. It's all them, isn't it? Oh, it's not? You mean when things are really great, that's not, you don't take credit for that? Is that you or God? Which is you or God? It's God, right? But on the negative side, we're going to take all the blame. Oh, I'll never be back to what God has ever intended for me. Really? Or are you exactly what God has intended for you? It's remarkable. Trust God and trust His Word. We emphatically teach that to our kids our friends. And you and I tomorrow morning, we wake up and wherever you want to read from in the Word, you open it and you say, whew, I don't know what I'm facing today. He goes, oh, I do. I know exactly what you're facing today. And you're fine so long as we don't trust our own selves, but rather Him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you're so good to us. Thank you very much. Thank you that we have the privilege through Jesus Christ to come before you and enjoy a healthy, growing relationship. We trust you with all our heart. We don't lean on our own understanding, but in all our ways, we acknowledge you, and we know and we believe that you direct our paths. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.